Good evening. Good evening to all and welcome to all those of you who are here in the building that have braved the, the much needed rain. We thank you. And we welcome all those that are listening, catching up in midweek on the uh, YouTube. Welcome to everybody. Um, I hope you've all had a, a piece of paper to tell you what's on during the week. Am I not on? No. Oh. <laughs> is it on? Yes, it's on. Oh. Carry on. Right, thank you. Where was I? Yes. Um, hopefully you've all had a, um, a leaflet to say what's on during the coming week. And those of you who are listening online will uh, have had an email to tell you what's on. We'll, we'll start with a call to worship from Psalm 92. It's good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord, how profound your thoughts. We'll now make music, our, our music to the Lord by singing our first hymn. Please stand if able and we'll sing, Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all, of all joy. Prayers of praise and adoration. Lord, we thank you, as the hymn that we have just sung says, that you are with us at all times of the day and night. Whatever we are doing, whether it be praising you, washing up, and all the other mundane jobs we do. We thank you for the sunshine that we have been enjoying and the rain both needed to help the plants grow. We have just so much to thank you for. The plants, the trees, the birds, animals and insects. The sea, the sand, the mountains and valleys. Wherever we look, 
we see your wonderful creation. Thank you, Lord. Help us remember to look after all your creation so others that come after us can enjoy it too. Lord, we thank you that we're able to worship you freely and we remember those in many countries all over the world that cannot do this. Some can't even own a Bible without being afraid of persecution of themselves or their families. We pray that you show them your love as they remember and praise you in their hearts. Amen. And we'll continue worship by singing our next hymn, The Lord's My Shepherd. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, we remember the countries that are presently at war. Be with the people who have made them homeless, lost their jobs and fleeing the country. Be with them wherever they are. And be with the leaders of the countries so that they may know you and that they can come with that they can come with for peace and stability in their countries. Lord, we think of our own country and worry about many of the decisions that are being made that are affecting our lives. And we pray that the leaders and decision makers will listen to you and your teachings to help make our country a better and safe place to live. We pray for our town, Rill, and as we walk along the streets and see the empty, derelict shops, we long for the time when it will again be a thriving place to live and work. We pray that one day that all the people of Israel will come to know you, but we remember the people that are working with food banks, homelessness, etc., and especially the work of Eunice at the AF Centre. Mm -hmm. Lord, we think of our church family who are recently bereaved, those that are suffering with illnesses and those that are housebound. Place your arms around them so they know your love. And we will say together the church prayers focus for June. 
Hello. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have called us to be the United Church in Rome. You bear us, sustain us, and love us. You have given us life. May we live as your body, loving, caring, reflecting your glory, and helping that all might know the freedom and joy of your presence. Amen. And we'll say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, thou it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, so deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'll now hand, us up, hand you over to Paul to share. A very good evening, everyone. It's uh, good to see so many folk here this evening. It's wonderful to, uh, to worship together and, uh, and to be joined as well by folk who are catching up later on in the week. Um, thank you, Barbara, for leading us in our worship tonight. Uh, we turn to, to God's Word and to the book of Isaiah. And uh, we, had a, we had an elders meeting this week. And uh, if you're fed up with Isaiah, I asked the elders, do you want to carry on with Isaiah? Is God speaking to us through his word, through Isaiah? And the answer was yes, so please carry on. So here we are, we're carrying on. Um, and we are uh, looking tonight at the start of chapter 46 um, of, uh, of Isaiah. Um, over the last uh, few weeks, uh, we've been thinking about this message of comfort that Isaiah has been asked to bring to this quite broken and vulnerable group of people the exiles who are living on the outskirts of Babylon, who have been exiled from Jerusalem, um, taken off there outside of their will, probably seen some horrendous things along the way. Think of some of the worst atrocities that you might have known around the world today um, or in your uh, lifetime, and we're probably somewhere quite close to what the, the experience would have been for the exiles uh, living in Babylon. And Isaiah is given this message to comfort these people and we've, we've been through, um, we've been through a, a number of different um, elements of Isaiah's message to the people and what God wanted to say to the people. And um, quite a lot of it has been focusing on um, God's purpose and plan. And this idea that God is sovereign over all, and even though horrendous things are happening, even though difficult things are happening, that doesn't mean that God is not sovereign and over all. And last week we thought particularly about what it means, uh, what it's like when we struggle to make sense of what God is doing and um, what his purpose and his plan is like um, because the reality around us is quite different from that. Um, and particularly of note was the, the passage in Isaiah 45, verses 9 and 10, where, where God um, says that he's, he's like a potter with some clay. And the, the idea is not that... Um, God's will should bend and change such that it fits our perceptions of what should be happening in the world, but that actually our lives should be changed and formed by God into that which will um, lead to his purpose and plan and will um, coming to fruition. Uh, now, in the midst of Isaiah 44, 45, and 46, um, Isaiah addresses the, um, the issue of idols within the society, and particularly within Babylonian society. And we, we glossed over some of that a little bit last week, um, choosing some verses through Isaiah 44 and 45 that didn't, didn't speak about that so much, um, although one of the points was don't make any idols. Um, so don't. Um, we're, but we're going to think a little bit more about that this evening because the start of Isaiah 46 addresses that point 
exactly. And we're going to hear the first 10 verses of Isaiah 46 this evening. But before Barbara comes and reads, let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Lord God, we come to you with uh, humble hearts, uh, wanting to hear your voice. And that's, Lord, what we ask as we turn to Scripture now. That as Barbara reads and as the word is preached and as we reflect upon it, we pray that each one of us would hear your voice, your encouragement, your instruction, your truth. That word that we each need to hear this evening. Come have your way amongst us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 1 to 10. Bell bows down, Nebu stoops low, their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnants of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born. Even to the old age and grey hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain, sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. With whom will you co compare me, or count me equal? To whom will you liken me, that we may be compared? Some pour out gold from their bags, and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god, and they bow down and worship it. They lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it up in its place, and there it stands. From that spot it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save them from their troubles. Remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Barbara. So, what are some of the biggest idols that there are in our society and culture? Um, something remarkable happened last evening. There was a football team <laughs> who won a football match. Um, and there is due to be a victory parade in Manchester tomorrow and there will be lots of people flocking to the streets to watch their idols parade with three trophies around the city. I, I don't deny them a minute because I remember it well from 1999 when another team <laughs> did exactly the same thing. But there we go. Uh, quite often when we think about idols, we might think of individuals in our society. There's the, there was a show, wasn't there, Pop Idol? Is it still on, Pop Idol? Does it still exist? No, it's gone. That was ages ago. My wife's just kind of going, no, no, that was a long time ago. That was ages ago. Um, <coughs> we we uh, uphold celebrities, don't we? Um, and other, other people of, of prominence in our society. But when, when God talks about idols, when we think about idols from a scriptural point of view, we're not just thinking about individuals and people, but we can think about anything, anything at all, that we might be tempted to love and go after instead of God. Anything that has the potential to take God's place in our lives. Things that we might worship and adore. Things that we might invest or we might go after. So as a society and a culture then, in the broadest possible terms, what are some of the, some of the biggest idols in our society today? I started writing down a list. Um, I've got some lists here. Um, so money, 
possessions, fame, likes on Facebook, followers, tweets, work, sex, family, home, lifestyle, rights, hobbies, individuality, health, fitness, pleasure, experiences, thrill, control, power. Can you think of others? IT, technology. It goes on, doesn't it? Would you argue against any of those things being like idols in our society today, things that we go after? It's so easy, isn't it, to spot in society, I think, as, uh, as, we, as we take a step back, particularly when we're in, in church, we can take a step back, can't we, and look at everything else that's happening in the world and go, ah, yes, yes, yes. It's easy to spot others who may well be tempted to follow idols and, and do that. I wonder, what about you? What about you? How much influence do these things have over the decisions that you make in your life? The Babylonians, uh, the captors of Israel, those that took those uh, exiles off to uh, Babylon, lived with quite a number of the same idols that we, we, we uphold today as a society and a culture. And they manifested themselves in a real physical display. Um, uh, the verse of, uh, at the start of chapter 46 talks about Bel and Nebo, two, two pagan gods idols that were cast as huge great big golden statues absolutely ginormous things that were on display in the middle of Babylon they're, they're so magnificent and wonderful that the historical evidence is that they existed that they they, they were there they, you know our, um, uh, historians have pointed to these for us apart from what our Bibles say that these these massive golden statues existed and once a year the, the, these massive golden statues would be taken out of the place where they, where they kind of sat the rest of the time in the city at the focus point, and they would be lifted up onto the shoulders of whole teams of people to cart around the streets so that everybody would be able to acknowledge and see these golden statues that represented all of their fame, all of their wealth, they followed after their strength their might their power this is how far we've come this is this is who we are we we bow down to these gods these are what we follow these are the idols that we go after and God's people who um, have come from Jerusalem have probably seen something similar to this but never quite like this before and and they're on this the edge of this Babylonian city they would see these golden statues being displayed, maybe brought past them so that they too could, could gaze upon them, so that they too could experience the, this kind of idol worship. They're watching, they're observing, perhaps sensing being drawn in a little, perhaps a little bit like us and some of the idols that we know in our society and culture. What does God teach his people about himself? about these idols, what might God want to teach us this evening? And that's what we hear in Isaiah 46. And uh, the first thing I want to mention is that uh, idols are only what we make them to be. Are only what we make them. Uh, where did Bel and Nebo come from? These huge, ginormous, golden statues. Verse six, some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god, and they bow down and they worship it. Where did Bel and Nebo come from? They came from the stuff that people had in their bags that they were prepared to weigh out. They paid a goldsmith who perhaps made coins and other bits of jewelry and things, and they paid a goldsmith to make a huge, enormous statue it's all all man-made isn't it human made now imagine if it's human made of course uh, a human gets to decide well how how big should it be I, I reckon the idol we need should be about that big um, and uh, well no, I don't, I don't quite like it that shape, so we'll make it that shape instead. And then, no, that's not quite right there, so I'll put it like that. And then I want it like that. 
And um, I think actually it'd be more beautiful if it was like that. And there we go. There we go. Look at that. upside down. There we go. Made. Done. All down to me. Exactly how I want. This little bit here, you see, it's just like that because I was thinking that those people just over there, they, they just, just see that little bit there. And this bit here, oh, that, that's an amazing little bit there. Can you see the detail there? Absolutely stunning. All down to me. I made that. I think we should worship this. Verse 7. They lift it to their shoulders and they carry it. They set it in its place and there it stands. From that spot, it cannot move. Go on, move. It's not moving anywhere. It can't move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save them from their troubles. Because it's just a lump of paper. <laughs> Why? Why can't it do it? Because it, it, that's all it is. It's a lump of paper, isn't it? Made by me. And that means that this lump of paper only either has the power that I give it or it's telling you a whole pile of lies. One or the other. I mean, it can't do anything else, can it? This is only as powerful as I make it to be for you or it's a pile of lies. Now, the Bell and Nebo, this lump of paper, is a very physical kind of display of idols, isn't it? Quite a lot of the idols I mentioned at the start of the sermon um, aren't physical structures that people might worship and bow down and be able to see. But are they any different? Are they any different? They just have the same potential to lie to us or they only hold the power that we choose to give them. Let's take money as an example. All of the cash in the world The world says, doesn't it, money will make you happy. Money makes you happy. That's what the world says, isn't it? Money makes you happy. And the fact that some of you have already sniggered tells me that that's a big lie, isn't it? Isn't it a lie? It's a lie? It's not true. Okay, fine. So it's not true. So if you have more money, you can spend more. That's a nice thing. Okay. What can you spend it on? The things that you choose to spend your power and your ability to spend it, isn't it? That's it. That's all it is. And your ability to spend it. All idols look extravagant. All idols promise all kinds of rewards. All idols say, everyone else is doing this, so you should as well. It's going to be great fun. Come and join us. And the reality is, it's just as ridiculous as a bit of paper on a stand. Now, some people might say, well, these things, of course, have come from God, and this bit of paper was made by God, so, so that's all right, isn't it? And you think, well, yes, um, it's been made by God. It's a bit of paper that God's... M- but, but really, it's our attitude towards it that's the issue, isn't it? That we've made it something else. Idols have no power beyond that which we give them in our attitude towards them. Can they answer? Can they save? Can they bring anything that we can't bring to ourselves? Can they do anything that we can't do? No, they can't. They can't do anything. I need a rest, somebody will say. I need a rest from all of my work and all of my striving. So do you know what? I'll take up a hobby. I'm going to take up windsurfing. I love windsurfing. Never done it before in my life. So because I need a rest and and I'm going to go after a new hobby, I'm really going to go for a new hobby, I'm going to take up windsurfing. So um, I go out, real beach, brilliant. I don't know whether you go windsurfing on real beach, it's probably a bad idea, don't do it. Um, uh, go, and I quite enjoy it. 
I quite enjoy it. So do you know what? I then go out to a shop and I buy myself a windsurf board and sail and a wetsuit. And then, you know, whenever the weather's nice, I go out and, and I go windsurfing. It's brilliant. I love it. Absolutely incredible. And then, right, I join a windsurfing club, which is another two days a week. Okay? And I go windsurfing at the windsurf club and then I go out windsurfing by myself. And then, and then the windsurfing club have a committee. They have a committee, so I join the committee. And then, and then that's another night a week. And all of a sudden, the thing that I went after, because I needed some rest and some relaxation, has made my life twice as busy as it was before. Where is it saving me? It's not saving me at all. Because why? Because I've made it an idol. Because I've gone running after it. When I feel worthless, I might display that somehow. and Put things on Facebook, write messages, send emails, tell people. And, and wait to hear for people to say how great I am, how many likes there are. And then all of a sudden I have to switch my phone off and I feel just as worthless as I did before. Isn't it true? Don't you see it over and over again? None of these idols can do anything apart from the stuff that we get. It can't, can't bring anything from outside. Like forgiveness. Like love. Like peace like hope, like joy. Not at all. In stark contrast then, we hear God say this. Remember this. Keep it in mind, verse 8. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do what I please. In contrast, God turns around and says, I'm not created. You haven't made me. I am. I exist. From before time began to the end of time, I exist. I always exist. I'll always exist. I just am. Am. There is none like him. From before time began to the end of time, there is none like him. He is unique. God is the only thing that exists that has never been created by anything or anyone else. He is unique. So there is no sense in which God is controlled by us, like this bit of paper, or limited by us, or made by us, or reliant on us, or on our worship, or on anything else that we might do or bring to work. God's not reliant upon it. He likes it, some of that stuff, but he's not reliant upon it. Verse 10. I will make known from the end, from the beginning, from ancient times, what is to come. He makes himself known. It's not because I choose to make him known, or you choose to make him known, or anybody else makes him known. He chooses to make himself known. Look around the world. See that tree there? Out there, it's beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely wonderful. God's making himself known there. He's done it himself. I, I've just got nothing to do with me. I've done nothing to that tree. It's just there. I say, says God, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please, says God. He will do as he pleases, whatever that might be. Not limited by us, but beyond us. He has the ability to bring to us that which we cannot create ourselves. Forgiveness, healing, hope, peace, truth. And the great news is that because God is not limited by us, that means today, tonight, in the next 20 minutes, he will do as he pleases. He'll speak to you that truth which you need to know, hold you in a love that's beyond compare, bring you stuff that 
doesn't even get close, does it? God is incredible. There is no one else like him. And the real heartbreaking thing about going after idols is that those idols instead become a crushing burden to people. Verses 1 and 2. Bell bows down, Nebo stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. So imagine that great parade with those huge golden statues and people having to carry them upon their shoulders. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. Did you pick that up? Isaiah says it three times in that one verse and a couple more times in verse 2. They're a burden. They're a burden. They're a burden. They become heavy. They stoop and they fall. Eventually, these statues are going to end up flat on the floor, crushing the people underneath them. And it will be such a deadly moment that actually those statues are sent off into captivity like the exiles have, chucked away. Now, you see, this bit of paper, right, if it only has the power that I give it, or is full of lies, then if I really desperately want to make this into an idol that you're all going to worship, I'm going to have to jump up and down an awful lot, aren't I, to get your focus and attention, to get over the fact that this is just a lump of paper for you. Okay? What am I going to have to do to do that? That's going to be exhausting, isn't it? Absolutely exhausting. I'm going to have to invest time and energy and effort into making this into an idol. We're going to have to have a, a big party for the piece of paper. We're going to have to have a parade. Should we organize a town parade for the bit of paper? Should we? Hold some events? Celebrate the bit of paper? And do you know what? As I do all of that, and then it's unearthed for the lie that it is, that's going to crush me. Isn't it? Isn't it? What a waste of a life around a bit of paper. All that energy. What a burden. In actual fact, that will keep going, if my attitude stays the same, that will keep going until this bit of paper crushes me. Until I collapse under the weight of what I myself have created. We keep going with that same attitude until we collapse. Just think about a, an example from our, from our own society. Think about the energy that is needed to sustain uh, the family life, the home life, the lifestyle, the work career, and the possessions that folk tend to like to gather together and go after that perfect family unit. And we go after it and after it and after it and after it. It becomes the idol that we look to create. And how many times do we just see that all break apart in our society and culture, don't we? It just becomes too much of a burden for people to carry, to create the perfect lifestyle. Now, this isn't, this isn't always the case, but I think we see so many broken people in our society because of the burden of the idols that we've created. Now, people get broken for all kinds of different reasons, and people struggle with their mental health for all kinds of different reasons. This isn't the sole reason, but I think one of the major contributing factors in our society and our culture is that we're struggling so much with our mental health because we've created out idols out of stuff that just want to break us and crush us. And it's such a heartbreak. It's such a heartbreak in our society because... Isaiah tells us that God desperately doesn't want us to have idols, but instead wants to carry us himself. Verses 3 and 4 must be the most beautiful verses in this context. God pleading with his people, listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born, even to your old age and gray hairs. No one here. I am he, I am he who will sustain you, 
I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. The idols in this, um, in this passage are shown to be human-made folly that weigh heavy upon us as we try to carry them. And God says, you've got it all wrong. You've got it all wrong. Because I, I made you, says God. And I'm going to carry you. You don't need to carry these. I'm, I'm the one doing the carrying. And I'm holding you. God who made you carries you. Idols will try to crush you, but God will sustain you. Idols will let you down, but God will be faithful to you. Idols will lie. God will speak his truth to you. And underlying that kind of analysis is, is a fundamental truth that there is only two sorts of religion in the world. Only two sorts. The first is that of human effort that creates stuff and a whole pile of unsolved problems that cause problem after problem after problem. That's one religion that there is in the world. And the other kind of religion is the religion that follows a God who serves, who gives, who sees, who hears, who carries, and who loves you. That's the only two. And friends, the great news for us this evening is that our God, our God is a God of grace, not of burden, so that we might be recipients of grace, not of burdens, so that we might receive out of God's goodness and his grace and not be weighed down heavy. And I know that's true because that's what I see when I look at the cross and I see the Lord Jesus Christ prepared to be crushed for our sake. Serving, giving himself up, even unto death. Even being like a slave. Being counted nothing such that he could give us all of his love and all of his grace. Friends, the cross is, is just a wonderful image, isn't it? Absolute wonderful image of faithfulness, of truthfulness, of goodness, of God serving and giving and loving. It doesn't even compare, does it? It doesn't even compare to the idols that we so readily take. Friends, the invitation for us tonight I, I want to be quite clear about this. It, it's, not about, it's not about laying aside our idols as if they're the wrong things to go after and instead we're going we're gonna to replace those idols with God that we're going to run after and we're going we're gonna to do God in like the way we might do idols. The invitation for us this evening is of course to ditch the idols and the attitude that we have that runs after them and simply to humble ourselves before God. He wants to carry us and sustain us and love us and cherish us. Not run around after him, trying to make it all work and all make sense, but simply to be recipients of his wonderful grace. Friends, um, some of you may have been a little bit uncomfortable before when I created an idol for us to pretend to worship in church tonight. You can speak to the elders afterwards and they will have a word with me, I'm sure. <coughs> Idols have absolutely no place. No place within our lives, within our church, within our society, within our culture, within our town. And once we get rid of them, 
all that is left is our God who existed from the beginning to the end. There is no one like him. With those idols gone, we're not tied to them any longer. There's no need for us to be slaves to them, not to run after them, not to uphold them, not to carry them, not to be burdened by them, but instead simply be a child of God, held in his grace, held in his love.
to bear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Lord God, as we've heard your words speak into our hearts and lives this evening, so um, we're just so aware of the temptations we each face to to become slaves of so many idols and so many fears, so many burdens that there are around us. Lord God, by the prompting of your Holy Spirit, would you just unearth that for us now in our hearts and lives? Point point that into Bring that into a spotlight for us, just to see where we're, we're being burdened by some of the idols that we've created. Lord God, as you highlight that for us and you draw our attention to it and the attitude of our hearts and we come before the cross and we see Jesus' invitation to lay our burdens down. His willingness to take our place upon the cross that we might know grace and forgiveness. And so, Lord God, in this moment, we turn from everything else. We recognize those idols for the worthless lumps of paper that they are. And instead, see the depths of your love for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that here, you declare that we're children of yours. We're no longer slaves to fear, but we are children of yours, precious, cherished and loved by you. And so Lord God, in the days ahead, we ask that your spirit would continue to prompt us and continue to help us unravel what that might mean for the way we live our lives and the way we make decisions. And I pray, Lord, that you would keep each one of us so close to you, sustained by you, carried by you, held by you, as the precious children that we are in your sight. We thank you so much for the grace for the mercy, for the love that you have shown us. And humbly we lay ourselves before you for your glory and praise. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, our final hymn this evening points us to um, declare our praise and, and, and joy at what Christ has done for us on Calvary. Uh, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me there at Calvary. So let's uh, stand if we're able as we sing together.
So shall we share with each other the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.